Hello, everyone. My name is Deacon Peter Loverick. I'm the Professor of Homiletics at St. Augustine Seminary here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. For the last several years, our seminary has hosted each year a seminar or a workshop or a conference, all dedicated to the basic question of how do we make Catholic preaching better. And we were blessed last week to have Father Thomas Shurgi address us. He came up to Toronto and he offered a seminar for us on preaching to the secular world, preaching in a secular environment. Father Thomas is a professor of theology at Fordham University in New York, and he lives in the Bronx, as he says with great gusto. And he uh, has taught homiletics and offered workshops all around the world, Australia, uh, United States, Africa, uh, Canada. And he was gracious enough to come up and give us a really well-received uh, uh, seminar last week, and he has been also gracious in granting this follow-up interview, which we are posting on the uh, YouTube site, Better Catholic Preaching. So, Father Shurgi, thank you for coming. You're welcome. It's good to be with you again. Uh, I must say that was a great day in Toronto uh, last week uh, for, uh, for the seminar there. Uh, please give the people who attended, uh, especially those deacons, uh, my, my regards. Uh, them. I enjoyed meeting all of them. Definitely, uh, we'll do that because we're going to contact them after this interview. Uh, we'll be sending them a note uh, as soon as the interview is up so that they can uh, watch this. Mm -hmm. We are going to be speaking uh, in this interview primarily about Father Shirky's wonderful little book, um, Longing to See Your Face, Preaching in the Secular Age. And at the end of this uh, interview, you will see uh, the closing credits. I will have all the information up, uh, ISBN numbers and so on, uh, so that you can get this uh, important little book, which will definitely help your preaching. But Father, before we get into this book, let's talk a little bit about you. Tell us your backstory. How, how is it that you have come into our Holy Catholic Church as a Holy Catholic priest? Ah, well, my, my vocation story. Uh, I always like to say that uh, when you grow up in, in Brooklyn uh, in the 1950s uh, as an Italian-American, and you're part of the Catholic parish, you think, a boy would think about priesthood uh, as a viable option, you know, for, uh, for vocation later on, along with Dr. Lawyer, Fireman, Indian Chief, and, and all that. Um, so uh, I was raised, uh, you know, in a good practicing Catholic family, you know, and, and church was a central part of our lives, along with Catholic school. Um, and then let me just focus on, on the priests I knew. Um, growing up there, uh, my sense, we had four priests in our parish, uh, three young men and the pastor, and, and these men were well respected uh, by, uh, by, by the parishioners, by my family. Uh, they were intelligent, they were sociable, um, they had a good sense of humor, and they could play baseball. I mean, for, for a boy, this was cool, and so I could identify with them. Um, later then, say, you know, in later high school and in college, when I thought more about what I wanted to do with my life, I, I was interested in law and politics, uh, and there were certain priests that were standing out in the news at that time. Um, and they were Jesuits, you know, like um, uh, Congressman uh, Robert Drinan in Massachusetts, a Jesuit and a congressman. Uh, there was Father Daniel Berrigan, uh, the radical activist and poet uh, protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, even got a mention in uh, Simon and Garfunkel's song, you know, with the, the radical priests they talked about. Um, there was also Father Teilhard de Chandon, who I was reading about in college, uh, the, uh, the French paleontologist, a scientist, and a priest. Um, so these men intrigued me uh, by their work and what they were doing. And then what helped especially was after I read in college Thomas Merton's uh, autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, um, I was able to make a weekend retreat with the Trappist monks in Spencer, Massachusetts. A wonderful weekend. Um, and I met with one monk each day just to talk. Um, and I left there thinking, I don't know if I could live uh, the monastic life. But those discussions kept pointing me in the way of the Society of Jesus. 
Um, and so I thought maybe I should look, uh, look at this more. So I, uh, I transferred colleges uh, to Lemoyne College in Syracuse, a Jesuit school where the novitiate is. So I got to take some theology there, look at Jesuits uh, up close and personal and found that uh, this was attractive to me. You know? So I applied and they accepted me. And here I am today. And here you are. So you became a priest, a Jesuit priest. But let's focus this a little bit. How how does how did you end up with um, such an interest, such a focus on homiletics, so that you go around the world giving uh, um, uh, conferences on hom on homiletics, or you write a book on homiletics? You um, <clears throat> mentioned during the. Uh, seminar that you gave last week, something very tantalizing. Maybe you could also speak about this in connection with how you got into homiletics. You mentioned that there are church documents which uh, uh, call us, uh, call priests especially, to homiletics as a most important hmm. uh, function for them. So could you speak a little bit about you and homiletics? Well, um, sure. Um, I think what uh, really uh, capped it for me was in my studies of theology. Um, we had three years uh, before ordination. And in my second year, uh, I took the required course in preaching. Uh, I had a great teacher, the Dominican uh, Father Jude Siciliano. Uh, and while I was studying preaching, I found I got even more interested in the studies of all the areas of theology. I was always thinking of how would I present this to non-theologians? How do I make these teachings, be it Christology, ecclesiology, what have you, how would I make this accessible to people? And so uh, I became more interested in theology then. Um, and then I, I enjoyed, uh, as nervous as I am, I enjoyed uh, preaching class there. And uh, at the end of the semester, uh, uh, Father Siciliano suggested to me, why don't you go on for studies here? Um, and a couple of my professors there, uh, Jesuit professors, they said the same, go on for studies and preaching and then hopefully you'll come back here to teach. Uh, and I ended up uh, doing, doing just that. Um, so for me, uh, so much of the, uh, theology is becoming a storyteller, uh, learning how to tell the story, the greatest story. Yeah. Uh, and so what you say too uh, resonated with me, uh, Deacon Peter, uh, from uh, the document the decree on the ministry and life of priests from Vatican II. This is back in 1965. And just a, a quote there, uh, priests as co-workers with their bishops have as their primary duty, the proclamation of the gospel of God to all. In this way, they fulfill the Lord's command, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. They say, this is the primary duty for priests, the proclamation of the word. You know, let me be blunt. Do we take that seriously? This is our primary duty, you know. Um, so I, I, I was encouraged by that statement there. And I want others to hear that too. Indeed, Pope uh, Paul VI and, and the uh, popes which followed have also uh, repeatedly stated that preaching is the primary apostolate. And this is not a modern invention. This goes back to Trent. I mean, Trent so has been calling us to better preaching for a long time. And as you say, are we taking it seriously? And that's what your book is all about. Are we going to take this seriously in a secular age? So let me start with one of the foundations upon which your book is built. You uh, refer to the um, uh, well-known homiletician and uh, writer on homiletics, Fred Craddock right. of Blessed Memory, who said, what well, you quote him saying that the whole purpose of preaching is to tell people what they want to say. Mm -hmm. So it's not what they want to hear, it's telling people what they want to say. At first glance, that may be hard to understand what this means. Could you could you unpack that for us? Yes, uh, when I read that from him, uh, I, I, I find this is often what happens at the special sacramental occasions, uh, like a wedding, like a baptism, like a funeral. Funeral technically, you know, is, is not a special sacrament there. Uh, but, um, but still, you know, these sacramental celebrations. Um, um, that people have a yearning, 
you know, uh, for eternal life, uh, a yearning for true love. Uh, the young couple bringing their child uh, for baptism believes this child is a gift and all this. So how do we give them the language uh, from within the tradition uh, to, to express themselves here uh, for that eternal love, for that uh, hope for eternal life, you know. So I think that the, the preacher, uh, by dint of his um, uh, time in prayer, his study, and his pastoral experience, can convey to these people what they want to say at this special occasion, you know, and for that they will thank you. Uh, so I need to be aware not to, pardon me, dumb it down, you know, and, and trying to make it, you know, try just to console people only, you know, but rather raise people up through our tradition to see what God is offering here. And do you mean this in terms of uh, helping people know what they want to say? Do you mean this also in terms of a regular liturgy on a Sunday and not, not just weddings and funerals? Do you mean this in pre for preaching in general? Yes, I, I think it goes on uh, every Sunday, uh, and, and, and a daily mass too, you know. Uh, that and people will say to you, you know, oh, thank you. Now I get it. Now I understand. It. That's what I needed to hear, you know, or just, you know, uh, the, the theme about the love of God, <laughs> the love of God to you. Another theme, uh, I, I've said this many times. I even thought, pardon me, that it was a throwaway line that it's okay to be angry with God. But every time I say that, someone will approach me after Mass. I didn't know that. I thought that was a sin. You know, so in other words, you're angry with God, yes, but let God know it. God can handle it. So you're right, on a daily basis, certainly weekly basis on Sundays, uh, this is appropriate. Certainly, that's what the Psalms do, do they not? They, yeah. they, they, they tell God, I'm upset, I'm angry, <laughs> I'm worried, I'm distressed, uh, I don't think you're with me. Uh, they, they voice what the people are saying, and we don't think the Psalms are sins. <laughs> good point good point um the other found it so the, the foundation of your book as i read it was based on this here is what the purpose of the homily is or what the homilist should be out to achieve mm -hmm. the next foundation i saw was how they should do it and you speak about it in a number of ways um you'll speak you speak about the importance of preparation which we'll get into in a few moments but you use a a, a cooking metaphor and you start with uh, a memory of your father preparing this wonderful lasagna sauce uh and you then also speak of you know exegeting the people knowing about the people and that will be the seasoning for the homily and you even speak about how uh, a really good cook not only knows how to cook it well, but also how to put it out on the plate very well. So you, you use cooking images all the way through. And it reminded me of, um, of Bishop Ken Ackner in his uh, wonderful book, Preaching Better. But he also uses uh, uh, cooking images, imagery in there. One of, one of my favorites, he quotes uh, from someone else. One of my favorites in there is he says that uh, homilies are prepared in crock pots, not in microwaves, right? Which yes. is this, this idea of, of rumination. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more for the preacher? Uh, when we prepare a homily, um, why is this cooking metaphor particularly apt for us? Oh, yes. Uh, and my father was, very, was delighted uh, when he read that in the book, you know, what I learned from him. But I, I would see him, uh, you know, uh, when he would prepare, cook his lasagna on Sunday, he would prepare the sauce starting on Friday night, you know, so after Friday dinner, you know, we clean up the table and all, and he would start in the whole preparation there. Um, then, uh, and then on Saturday, that sauce would just sit on the back burner, you know, uh, he didn't do anything with it, maybe stir it, but that, that's it. And then on Sunday, mm, you had a good sauce. Now, that same work he could have done on Sunday afternoon, you know, for, for Sunday dinner, but it would, would not taste as good, you know, because something happens to the sauce as it sits there, you know, as the flavors marinate and all this. And in a sense, it's working there even while he wasn't, you know. So it, it dawned on me, that's what we're doing with preparation, uh, preparation for our, our homilies, you know. We start early. Uh, you, you can do this early, you can do this Saturday night, but you, you start early 
uh, with the prayer, with the reading, you know, ruminating. And then throughout the week, um, it's, it's on the back burner of your brain. It's working there, you know. Uh, same amount of time, in a sense, you know, uh, but the product is very different. Um, so I, I'm sorry, what else did you ask there, uh, Deacon Peter? Well, I wanted to, um, to, to, to get into this, uh, 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 you also spoke about seasoning oh, with right. the, uh, with, uh, by recognizing the specific qualities or characteristics uh, of the congregation. And you also spoke about arrangement on the plate. Right, right, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, we use the term, you know, just as you exegete the scripture, uh, you, you analyze, it, right? Um, you also want to exe exegete the congregation. Who is there? There is no such thing as a typical congregation. You know, uh, so the congregation I would find in, in Toronto, say, when I would not presume is the same I would find here in the Bronx. Okay, uh, similarities, yes, but uh, but not the same. And so I need to know who's in the congregation. You know, uh, male, female, old and young, uh, educated or, or not. You know, do they want to be there or not? You know, uh, what kind of entertainment do they use? What do they read? And things like this. Uh, and how can I appeal? How can I appeal to them? You know, so the seasoning is there. Uh, the chef has to know um, how to season the, the sauce and all that for those who are dining. You know? And then any chef will tell you that uh, presentation of the meal is key. You know, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how you present it on the plate and, and at the table. That's key. And so uh, you may have good ideas for your homily, but how are you gonna present this in a way that, that's orderly, that makes it accessible, and that shows you care about them? And all. So all this, now part of it, I think is being Italian, my Italian ancestry, all of our examples go back to food, uh, right? Um, so I, I think this, this helps, you know, there are uh, parallels there. So you have this concept of, I'm gonna, Put a homily together to help the people know what they want to say and it's going to simmer like a <laughs> yes, pot yeah, yes. over a week or so and it's going to have the spices which means it's going to rec it's going to take into account specific qualities of the of, uh, of the people now to do that your own method uh you call the four r's if i read the book correctly right. so could you take us through uh, Father Shurgi's four R's of preparing a homily. Sure. Uh, the four R's are to, to reflect, uh, to uh, research, to write, uh, and to rehearse. Okay. Uh, reflect, research, write, and rehearse. So to reflect is to pray. Before anything else, uh, you have the scripture for, let's say, next Sunday, uh, and just listen to it, read it, read it aloud. You know, uh, question, what does it say to you? I think sometimes we jump into it, especially when we're nervous. What can I say about it? Hold on, sit back. What does it say to me? Let it speak to me. Meanwhile, I have my congregation in mind. You know, uh, what is it saying to me? How will they hear this? So I spend time reflecting on it. Um, after that, then I go to the research. Uh, and so, uh, by the way, I would spread this out over the week, you know, so um, I, I follow um, Walter Burkhardt of Happy Memory, his formula, you spend uh, one hour of, of preparation for every minute in the pulpit, right? Uh, so let's say you're preaching for eight minutes, you will prepare for eight hours, but that's not eight hours sitting at your desk at one time, right? So over the week, so spend time in reflection and prayer, spend time in research, that's when you go to the commentaries, uh, to the experts. Uh, what, what are they saying about this? They tell me what I can say, also what I cannot say. I may misunderstand a passage. Uh, and so uh, they can help guide me there. Um, if I go to them before uh, the reflection, they, they become my boss. They dictate to me where I go. If I go to them after my reflection, they accompany me along the way. After uh, uh, research comes the writing. Uh, I do think it's important to write it out, whether or not I take the manuscript with me into the uh, ambo, 
ultimately, but, but to write it out. It gives me a, a, a map, if you will, beginning and middle and end there. Also the connecting points, how I go from point one to point two and point three, et cetera. So it's smooth. I have the vocabulary there. You know? um, and then quickly uh, the, rehearse, uh, the rehearsal. Uh, I'll, I'll say it out loud, maybe with a videotape, you know, or at least a, an audio tape. Uh, how does it sound? Question, does it sound like me? Or does it sound like I'm trying to be somebody else? I'm trying to be a great preacher or something, you know? Uh, does, it, does it sound genuine, you know? And how will they hear this? So those are what I call the four R's. In your book, you mentioned something else that you do in this uh, preparation. Uh, you, um, there is a, an application of, uh, this is wonderful document from the American bishops, uh, the gem fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, it's a, just a terrific little thing. And in it, it, it speaks about a homily preparation group. Uh, and it goes through in a very uh, specific way how to do that. And in your book, you write about working together with a group of Jesuits to prepare homily. Could you tell me how a homily grows out of a group participatory uh, process? Yes, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you brought in Fulfilled in Hearing. I think every preacher, every Christian preacher uh, should read that. It's a great help. The, um, uh, what I call the uh, homily prep group, uh, here, we do this in my house, the Jesuit community at Fordham. Uh, we'll meet on Tuesday. Uh, we don't meet on Monday because that's community night. But we meet on, on Tuesday after dinner for 45 minutes. Um, and four or five of us will, will come together, whether or not we're preaching on Sunday. Uh, some of us, like myself, find it a good prayer group. Uh, no preparation required. Just bring a copy of the scriptures for next Sunday with you. Uh, then uh, when we're ready, uh, we'll read the scripture and we'll just assign it. You know, okay, you, uh, you, you read the gospel. The gospel is first. Then you read the uh, first reading. You read the psalm. You'll read the second reading. Um, slowly, and the rest of us just listen. Pause. And then we start talking about it. What did you hear? What stands out? What images come to mind? What words speak to you? Right? Um, does anything confirm you or challenge you? Uh, maybe the classic scholar in the group will parse a, a Greek or Hebrew term for us, you know, uh, and, and all this. Someone will comment on how this is going to play to his congregation on, on Sunday, right? We have different congregations. Uh, and then we go around like that, and we end up always with the question, so what's the good news? Just go around the room and say that. Uh, and so there, there you have it. Now, so there'll be no panic on Saturday night. What are the scriptures, you know? What am I gonna say? We're mulling over it. Um, the sauce is now on the back burner. So this is a, uh, an example of where many cooks can make a good broth at <laughs> the end, right? I hadn't thought of that, right. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's pull this together a little bit. Um, you've uh, spoken about your purpose of preaching, we've talked about your method of preaching, we've talked about a metaphor that you used um, uh, uh, for preaching. This is all about preaching itself. But what about the person of the preacher? Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, you make a very interesting observation at one point. You say that um, you talk about how the, the preacher uh, comes in to the um, church and uh, greets the people and then turns to God and say, here are the people that want to greet you or here are the people that want to come to you. So there's this kind of mediator image where he's um, in one way, he's speaking to the people, then, then he's also speaking to God and he's kind of going back and forth. Could you elaborate a little bit on uh, how you see the person of the preacher in preaching? Well, uh, the word you use there, he is the mediator, right? Um, this is why we ordain a man, you know, to mediate the presence of Christ here in the assembly. Uh, so let's remember that. He stands up there in this strange outfit, <laughs> you, you know, uh, alb, uh, alb and stole and chasuble and all this. Clearly, he's set apart that way. Um, 
so uh, it, it reminds us that we are here to meet the Lord. We're here, here to meet, meet the Lord. And so uh, the greeting, that's why, should be somewhat formal, you know, uh, after the, uh, the sign of the cross and the Lord be with you. Please, no good morning, you know, that, that misses the point, all right? But rather greet the people warmly, yes. And then when we're ready, uh, we, we acknowledge ourselves as saved sinners in the penitential rite. We give glory to God. Now, let us pray. Right, we have the colic pause there. Uh, ideally, people are now offering their own prayer silently, and then the priest collects them, right, and gives them to the Lord. Okay, now we're ready to begin here. Uh, uh, we're ready to hear the word of God. So the role of the mediator is, is crucial. So the the, the preacher is turning to God, turning to the people, turning to God and bringing, uh, being, and, and, be, and in the homily he gives is bringing it to the word of God together with the, with the, with the prayers of the people into one place. Yes, and, and uh, you know, as, as you, and you write about this in, in your book too, uh, let's remember that the word is sacramental. Mm -hmm. And as um, uh, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, made clear about the fourfold presence of Christ in the liturgy, right? Uh, certainly in the elements of the bread and wine become the body and blood of our Lord, right? Um, in, in the priest, right? In the assembly and in the word proclaimed and preached. So here is, uh, here is Christ, you know? And so I, I try to think of this as just when I'm, just as when I'm handing a person the host, and I say the body of Christ, and she or he says, amen, right? When I'm preaching, here is the word of, of Christ. So it's not just talking. It's not just the talk that's happening. There's something holy, something sacred is happening in the preaching. So the it, it's not, um, well, we've been doing holy things. You can sit back in the pew and relax while you hear a talk. There's, right. there's something holy that's happening. That's right. That's right. And so that, that should fire us up as, as preachers. You know, this isn't just a talk. These aren't the announcements, you know, but rather Christ is speaking. Christ is here in your, your midst. As Jesus said, you know, in his first, in his first sermon, you know, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. May we all preach like that. So if this then is the role of the preacher, this kind of holy mediator doing something very special here uh, at the AMBO, this now brings the question from your intentions of what you want the homily to do and be and accomplish and, and your method of doing it and your, recognize, your recognition of the identity of the preacher. This brings it all to your vocation as a teacher of preaching. And in other words, how do you train people to do this, and you make a very interesting, um, provocative comment, which I'm, I, I hope you could uh, explain a little bit here in your book. You say that you know you can't really, or a homiletics professor can't really teach students how to preach. Mm -hmm. All he can do, you say, is to free them to articulate <clears throat> an ancient message. You said for a modern listener, mm -hmm. could you? Speak about this, that you can't really teach them how to preach, but you can free them to preach. Yes, there's an old preacher's axiom that says uh, preaching uh, isn't taught, it's really caught, you know. Um, and so um, the idea is that some, some uh, will be able to do this, you know. Some will be able to understand the, the word of God, uh, internalize it, and then interpret it for for the hearers so what uh, what i try to stress with my students is i don't want i don't expect them to preach like me as if that were something special you know that's that's not the point you know but, but rather to find your own voice i'm helping them to find their own voice uh, so that they can recognize the word of god through their own lips here you know to, uh, so how to do that um and along the way i'm asking them is this the best you can do you know, uh, have you spent time in prayer, in study, and in preparation, and in the presentation? You know, so you get it to a point where now you're announcing the word of God. 
I, I do make a distinction between those who are preaching, really preaching, and those who are trying to preach. Uh, th those who are, are really preaching, you know it, you can feel it, you're inspired by them, you learn something. Those who are trying to preach, eh, they have a good idea, but um, they need to, to work at it some more. So I'm really trying to free up my students, again, so that they can find their own voice. So the student should not be trying to be the next Archbishop Fulton Sheen or Bishop Robert Barron or Tom or Father Thomas Shergi. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not, not at all. You know, I remember uh, one of the first times I preached in class and I used the three points, right? Like this very methodical. And Jim Siciliano said to me, uh, now uh, that was interesting. I said, well, I, I learned that from Father Walter Burkhardt. He said, well, that's, that works well for Burkhardt. But what about for sure? <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, he made the point, you know, uh, again, to find my own voice here, you know. Yeah, we've had Father uh, uh, Siciliano uh, as one of our presenters up in our in our series. And mm -hmm. uh, I was delighted to find out from you that uh, uh, that he was one of your teachers and that you are a, a student. It's interesting how um, uh, great homilists, you know, c c come together and grow out of out of this uh, um, uh, connection. Let's go a little bit further with the students. Uh, so the, you are not going to teach them how to speak. You're going to free them. And it's an ancient message, which is the message of the word handed down through the tradition of the church. And you say it's for modern listeners. So this is where the spicing of the dishes comes up, right? Where you right. are going to um, make it um, uh, intelligible or meaningful to uh, a modern audience. Now. But you also say in your book that one of the things that you want to be sure that these students do when they become preachers is that in their preaching, they help these listeners, this modern audience, mm -hmm. to experience hopefulness, to experience the, uh, the, the power of God. Uh, so there is a hopeful quality to the preaching that you ask them for. But yet that's on um, uh, uh, page 15. But on the very next page, page 16, you mm -hmm. put a caution. You say, however, we, they have to be very careful of just preaching about Christ through success stories alone, which I presume means healing or uh, answers to prayer or miracles or things like that. Could, could you um uh, explain this a little bit the homily is supposed to be hopeful but not just a series of success stories yes yes and the series of success stories we hear that a lot today with the so-called gospel of prosperity you know um there are some of these tv evangelists who have uh, loads of stories uh like this you know um uh, and it leaves me thinking you know would that i were uh, that person you know wouldn't that be good um so uh, it, when, when something goes well in our lives, it's good to be thankful and, let, and we can thank God for that. Uh, but I, I always wonder um, what happens when we say, oh, this person had cancer and now is cured. Oh, God blessed her, you know? Uh, this person was very poor and then was able to uh, restore himself financially. Oh, God blessed him. Um, well, be thankful, yes. But what about the person who was not cured? What about the person who was still financially indigent? Um, did God ignore them? Are they cursed? Um, so uh, I, I'm very wary of how I use these terms of uh, being blessed. You know? um, and I think it, it, it came, uh, it hit me uh, after uh, you know, September uh, 11th you know, in, in New York City, uh, um, you know, this, this devastation. Where do we find hope now? Uh, and, and people were scrambling, meaning well, you know, to find hope here. And one person told me, well, think of all the people that were saved, that God was there. But what about the people who were not saved, like my cousin? Uh, I never saw her again. Uh, no, then I, then I heard a preacher, and I, and I write about this in the book. I heard a, a preacher say you know, um, that um, if you look at the, the first tower, flames coming out of it, it looked like a cross. And then this, then another plane came through and hit the second building and it looked like it was going into the cross there, almost like piercing the side there. 
like on Calvary. And, and the preacher said, Christ was there with those who were dying. Um, there's the hope. We want to go on from here. We need to know that God is with us here. Uh, and I think that's the role of the preacher. It always moved me how uh, Martin Luther King Jr. preached like that uh, to the African Americans. You know, it, he spoke to them in their suffering and helped to raise them up from there. Uh, no pie in the sky piety for him. God was with them there. So I, I hope I'm, I'm clear on this. Right? I just think let us offer real hope. And uh, you know, we, we are not called to be optimistic. You know. Uh, looking on the bright side of things. That's good, you know? Uh, but, but the hopeful person uh, doesn't just see the light at the end of the tunnel, but goes through the darkness there. The, the hopeful person uh, doesn't see the glass as half full or half empty. The glass is empty, like the uh, water jars at Cana, but believes that they will be filled again. In other words, not to, to be hopeful, but not to be a, a Pollyanna. Uh, right? yes. And ap after all, um, uh, in every Catholic church, when you go in, the, the central image is, the, is a crucifixion, of, uh, somebody suffering on the cross, right? We uh, uh, Catholics face uh, suffering and sorrow. We look it right in the face and we right. uh, uh, don't uh, pretend that it's not there. Mm -hmm. um, but this message, of hope in the midst of, oh, the Twin Towers, in the midst of the, the, can the, the cancer patients that you mentioned, or in the midst of all the daily troubles that we have. How does a preacher preach that message of hope to the growing group, which um, is being called the nuns, not, not women with veils, but the, the uh, N-O-N-E-S, those who are without faith or those who have who have had faith and have left the church and are not practicing or for example um when father you preach at a funeral or or a wedding and you're well aware that a great many perhaps the majority of the people there um never darken the door of a church and are bib and are uh, um, essentially biblically illiterate they don't really know the tradition or the story how do you preach to them, and that in, indeed is sort of the um, a question that's right in the subtitle of your book. You know, preaching to a, a secular environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, good, good question. Um, without in the funeral, without making it a eulogy, um, I focus on how did Christ shine His light through this person? How did this person make us aware of, of the Christian lifestyle in some way or other? You know, what could we learn from this person? So uh, I am going to talk about the person here, but not just about what a good time Charlie he was, you know, uh, or imagining his life in heaven now. Um, what can we learn for, uh, for him? And I want to show respect to for the family and the loved ones, which is what the funeral ritual calls for. OK, so starting there, this is something we all have in common. We're here to grieve for our our family member, for our friend. We'll, we'll start there. Uh, and then touch on those, uh, that yearning for eternal life. Uh, that says, ah, there's something here. I, I can't believe this is the end. This is over. You know, uh, that, that it's not me talking. It's Jesus Christ who spoke about this a long time ago um, and offering us eternal life. Um, and hopefully people will grab, grasp this, you know, uh, that there's something in it for them. I do believe it's a universal message. It is not peculiar to Catholics. We Catholics have a strong message and, should, and it should be preached. And I would hope these nuns can hear it and appreciate it. You um, have used, as we've spoken earlier, a metaphor for uh, uh, of, of packaging all of this in a way that connects. You use the metaphor of cooking, but in the latter part of the book, you change the metaphor mm -hmm. and you speak about, okay, there's another way to look at this. Uh, uh, a, a homily could be like a piece of music and you say it could be classical music or it could be popular music or it could be jazz. <laughs> but you, uh, <laughs> I'm 
a jazz fan. So could you tell me how, um, how is the homily like classical, popular, or jazz music? Yes, I use this for uh, really the composition of the homily, you know, to help the, uh, the preaching student be aware of the style that he or she will use, you know. So uh, is it, now I'm no musician, right? So I, I use this loosely, but is it uh, classical, which is a more formal style? The, the text would be written out, you know, uh, word, word for word, and the preacher will follow that, right? It's well ordered. Uh, we go we go by that and the preacher will know uh, his or her audience too here um, jazz I'm a jazz fan too uh, and so there is a structure to it but the jazz musician uh, is open to improvisation and so as you're preaching then you may get a sense that oh this point really connects with people I can see that looking at me maybe they're nodding you know if it's a black congregation maybe they go uh-huh you know and all this so maybe here I need to take a little more time with this spin it out a little bit develop this idea you know likewise uh there may be a point that I thought was really rich and I'm not getting any feedback there okay maybe just make the point and move on from there you know, but be ready to improvise uh, here. The popular one would be a, a simpler style, but can also be powerful. Uh, you have the basic message in, in stanzas with a refrain. You come back to that refrain there. Uh, this would be very helpful, say, with youth. You know, so when you when they leave, it's very clear what the message is. So each one is good, classical, jazz, or popular. It's uh, which style do you use? And sometimes you need to change it up. I normally use jazz, but for a certain formal occasion, I should go to classical. Or if I'm dealing with children, maybe the popular one. I knew a priest um, uh, father when I was studying homiletics who, um, who, had, who told me he had, uh, I think, five or six masses every weekend uh, at his church. And he preached a different homily at each of the masses. Uh, because of, of the way you're speaking, like what one 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 congregation would um, require the popular because, because you're said the young people, another one the jazz, another one maybe the more classical approach. I mean the scriptures were the same, but he sure. had to repackage it. Um, this is really taking the exegesis and the seasoning very <laughs> very seriously. Yes, God bless. Um, since we're talking about packaging or arrangement or uh, uh, structure of the homily, there is something interesting in that I found very interesting in the book that um, I'd like you to help me with because it, it, it's uh, it, it was a kind of fresh idea for me. You said you work on your homily, you do all the you let it simmer the whole week long, and then you put it together and you write it all out, and then you throw away page one. <laughs> Could you, <laughs> so page one is gone and you're, so you're starting with page two. So could you tell me what was wrong with page one and what does that practice really mean? Uh, well, I found for myself, uh, uh, I would start writing, you know, uh, you get to a point where I, I have to start writing now. I can't wait till I think it's ready. Start writing, you know, and uh, certain ideas, certain images, maybe a story would help me get into uh, the writing of the homily. But then when it's finished, I look back and say, well, page one was necessary for that purpose, but it's really superfluous to the homily. You know, it's uh, the, the stereotype is it, you know, well, when I sat down to look over the scripture for today, I thought about it. Do we really need to hear how you prepared? You know, just go into it. Um, when you think of great stories uh, in books or great movies, uh, they start right into the story. Very few stories begin once upon a time, this happened. So I would say the more immediate we can be getting into the story, uh, getting into the homily, uh, that will make it more effective. So throw away page one. Well, what are your thoughts on the length of the homily, Father? Well, um, generally speaking, and Pope Francis has said this too, you know, eight to 10 minutes, I, I think, uh, would be good for Sunday. Uh, for weekdays, I would say, three to five okay now this is conditional uh certainly it's cultural uh if i were in a uh african-american parish here uh at least double that you know it'd be be 10 to 20 maybe maybe even longer you know also for uh hispanic uh, liturgies too 
it should be longer. So you have to understand the culture too. But uh, I would say for Anglo congregations, eight to 10 minutes. So if we're speaking three to five on a daily or an eight to 10 on a Sunday, then really you don't have the time for that whole first page of how I prepare the homily and where <laughs> if, if you've only got, if you, so after you do that, now you've got seven or six minutes left, yeah. right? Right. Um, the, uh, I'd like to go back to the subject of, of hopefulness, uh, which you want to bring to the, um, to the listener without necessarily giving them a, uh, uh, an immediate success story, but you, sometimes there are success stories, but you want to bring them hope. Uh, you, you, you say in your book, connected to this, connected to the idea of hope, never mention the word love in a homily unless uh it appears it, it the word love appears somehow in the scriptures of that mass right. a lot of us are very used to hearing uh luv homilies right love yes. <laughs> right. uh but it, it, you caution your seminary students away from that could you tell us why very simply because i think the word love is overused and so uh, it's losing its meaning. Love is very important. You know, I'm not going to say simply that it makes the world uh, makes the world go round, but that uh, but the basis of our faith is true love. But what does it mean? So if the preacher just glibly says, "So it's all about love," well, again, what does love mean? Uh, you know, when uh, when Paul talks about this in First Corinthians, you know, love is patient and kind. Uh, that's pretty detailed there. And he makes a clear point that love is not a feeling. Love is not merely an emotion. And popular culture would lead us to believe that. You know, love is, uh, love is a feeling. Uh, Pope, uh, Pope Francis, uh, in his encyclical on love, he takes Paul's letter there and goes through it very carefully, parsing the Greek terms, you know, about what, uh, what love is. That's good, you know. Uh, so I would say don't use love unless it's in the scripture, because we may end up cheapening the meaning of love. Uh, you also refer to um, uh, when we're talking about the the of what the comedy is accomplishing and 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 for avoiding missteps and so on. You also base your work uh, on references to Saint Augustine, particularly in Doctrina Christiana. That's the section four. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gives several uh, qualities of, of an oration and which then he applies to preaching. And one of them is to delight the people. Mm -hmm. Now, you say earlier that it's not, the homily is not really to give what the people want. It's to give what the people um, need to say or want to say, right? It's not not what they want to hear, right. but what they what they want to say. So, can you put that together with um, how do you understand? Because you put it in the book, how do you understand the call to delight? Uh, is that to make to please people? Uh, how do you and and also maybe you could also connect it. Uh, and a few pages later, you speak about the whole issue of humor in in homily. So, right. could you? Speak a little bit about that. Yes, uh, Augustine says that there's a threefold purpose to preaching, right? To, to teach, to delight, and to move. And he says he takes this from Cicero, the, the great orator. Um, so delight there, uh, from the Latin, uh, it's, it's inspirare, to inspire, right? So that's what he means. Clearly not to entertain, not to amuse, right? Uh, but to inspire. For Augustine to delight, uh, means that uh, you create the sense that the, the preacher is talking to uh, the, the hearer. The hearer says, wow, it's like he was talking to me, you know. Uh, so inspire, uh, to inspire there, you know, uh, that I am, uh, that I'm taking this to heart, right. So I, I preach in such a way that it will make a difference to this person, you know. So uh, it's not about uh, telling jokes. It's not about uh, telling uh, folk tales or anything like that, right? Uh, it is about how do I inspire? So I need to get out of the way here, right? And let the Lord speak. 
What is the Lord trying to say to these people here and now? Now, uh, I do think humor uh, can be effective as a way to, to get the message across. Right? Um, I, I think humor is part of the human condition, uh, that, that we find humor in, uh, throughout our lives, even in the most dire situation. Uh, so let's, uh, let's distinguish this. We're not talking about telling jokes. We're, 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 I, I say a joke strictly for the purpose for a laugh. And that's good at parties and elsewhere. Right? Um, but do I find the humor in the situation? Humor that also, uh, often comes from a surprise. You know, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, and and that, that makes it laughable. It forces me to... Uh, it forces me to laugh, you know. Um, I think of where uh, Jesus meets the, uh, the woman uh, who has a, a daughter with an evil spirit. Uh, and uh, there, uh, she is, uh, she's a Gentile. Uh, and she asks for Jesus' help. And Jesus says, you know, uh, woman, it's not right to give, the, uh, to, to give the dogs food from the table. Now, you would think that's a real insult. But actually, it's a verbal spar. Uh, with this woman, and she responds, but uh, but even the dogs get the, end up getting the scraps from the table there. Um, she actually, and, and Jesus says, you know, woman, your faith has saved you. She gets the best of Jesus, probably the only one in the Bible who does that, right? But you have to understand. Sounds very New York. It, it, it's, it's very New York. Right? Uh, and so a New Yorker can appreciate that. You know, one, one up on me, good for you, you know? All right, I will give you what you want. Uh, so what I mean to say is there's humor in the Bible, uh, or sometimes even the way we apply uh, a story from the scripture to our lives today uh, that offers us hope. We can find humor there. Basic rule though, um, if you're naturally funny, use humor. If not, don't. Nothing worse than trying to be funny in the pulpit. Father, we have... Um, uh people who are uh, watching the videos on this YouTube channel who are liturgical preachers. They are uh, priests, they are uh, permanent deacons. Uh, we also have lay preachers, um, uh, pre people who will preach in a variety of, of situations and uh, witness their faith and so on. And then others who are, um, they are listeners of, pre uh, of preaching and they're interested in how all of this um, goes together. For the preachers among us, lay and uh, ordained, mm -hmm. could you, what would you, out of your wisdom, would you boil down as the, here's what's needed in the church today for preaching that, that you can do, that will, that will make a difference uh, in Catholic preaching right now. Do you have anything like that that you can, I mean, you've given us preparation and all kinds of things, but is there kind of one thing that if we get this right, uh, it's going to already make a difference and we'll be on the right track? Well, you just said it. I would come back to that word preparation. Preparation. Uh, I, I say it in the book and I, I've said it uh, all over that. Um, I think of preaching as suffering today, it's not due to a lack of intelligence or lack of eloquence. I think that we are well trained intellectually in the tradition. We know it. Uh, eloquence, uh, people are not listening for a great orator. Listen, they're listening for a holy person. Uh, but if there's one problem, it's a lack of diligence, taking the time to prepare. And with the prayer, we start with prayer, excuse me, with the, uh, with, with the preparation, we start with prayer, praying about this. And again, uh, what is the Lord saying to us uh, with this scripture here? You know, uh, as I said a minute ago, the people are listening for a holy person. Maybe the best compliment a preacher could get, could hear, is you really believe this. You know, would that they would say that about us more often? You know either to our faces or to their neighbors. You know, you really believe this. Uh, do I exude that belief? Right? And then the care, the prayer, and then the care that, that I put into this, you know, to, uh, to study, to write, and research, you know, um, and all that goes with it. Um, that here I'm offering something beautiful, uh, the best I can offer, but it's gonna be beautiful.
you know, uh, to people. So I do, I do come back to that, Deacon Peter. Uh, we need to prepare. So if the preacher takes seriously the call of the church that preaching is the primary apostolate, the preacher is going to put in the time. Precisely. Precisely. Father Shergi, thank you for this. This has been fantastic. This is this and much more uh, 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 wisdom from a, an experienced preacher and teacher of preaching is in this book. Uh, I will be uh, putting up the uh, 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 information about where you can get it and IS, IS and ISBN numbers right at the um, in the in the uh, credits so that you can take a look at this. Father Shergi, thank you for spending your time. Thank you for coming up to Toronto, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again. God bless. And thank you very much, Peter. I, I appreciate this time together.